Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, uh, as we come to talking about children, I've been saying steadily as we've been approaching this that we call it dedicating children, but in reality we're more dedicating parents. We pray for the children, we bless the children, we're glad to have the opportunity to honor the children and recognize the children, but it, it's the parents which are making a dedication here. We're, we're not sprinkling some magic sauce on the kids and preparing them so that they've got the, the, you know, the wide door to heaven after that or something. There's this, but we as parents are standing and accepting that responsibility, saying, I recognize that I have a... a God has put in front of me an assignment with this person. And I want to fulfill that assignment. And I'm doing, in, in front of these witnesses, I'm making a commitment to that assignment. That's essentially what this becomes about. And so, uh, while children are a delightful blessing, I'm probably going to talk a good deal more about parenting um, than I am about children per se. But one of the things we recognize about children... There's a lot of, uh, we tend to notice the good things about children. They're attractive to look at. But along with the good things, one of the things which is characteristic of children is that we are all born irresponsible and self-centered. You may have the brightest child who ever lived, but they're still irresponsible and self-centered at the beginning. It may be the cutest child who ever lived, but they're still irresponsible and self-centered at the beginning. And a good deal of our assignment is to transition them from irresponsible and self-centered to responsible and compassionate. <laughs> if they get all the way through their time with me and we're best friends and we've got an awesome relationship, that's nice, but if they're still irresponsible and self-centered, I missed the ball. The target was responsible and compassionate, not irresponsible and self-centered. There's a lot of other things we may accomplish along the way. There's a lot of positive things which come out of this process, but ultimately the purpose is to move them from irresponsible and self-centered to responsible and compassionate, right? That, that's what we're working towards. And in essence, that process is discipleship. What we do with our children is disciple them. And as a consequence, the principles that are engaged with the process of raising children are principles that all of us need to be engaged with because whether we deal with children or not, we are children who need to be raised and we need to be spiritually in the business of raising children. Is that coming through? And so no matter which end of the discipleship process we're on, I need to be more discipled than what I am or I need to be more of a discipler than what I am whether we're at the front end of the tube or the back end of the tube, either way, we need to be focused on these principles and the instructions in Scripture concerning these things because that is the process that, that is uh, the, the spiritual process which salvation brings. Are you awake? And so we've, we've got that in front of us. Then also, well, shall we go there? Okay, we can go a little bit there. The... Uh, This isn't going to take a very long time because we're not going to look at everything the Bible says about parenting. We're just going to look at a couple of things in particular. But the process is largely about training people to hear from God. The recognition is that obeying God is extremely important. And one of the things I have to do is model that. I model it for my children in two particular ways. One of them is that when they're very young, it's about obeying me. Because if they learn to obey, they can transfer that to God who is more honorable than I am. Are you 
home. So they must learn to obey when they don't understand the reason, when they have no comprehension of what's going on, it just needs to be done because I said so. But there comes a day where it also becomes about modeling it in the sense that they're watching me to see if I obey God. It becomes difficult if I, if I sit on the front row and the sermon is on the subject of prayer, and I'm cheering and saying amen, and every time the pastor says, if you don't pray every day, I don't even know if you know God. I say, yeah, yeah, preach it, preach it. And my kid's thinking, I don't think I've ever seen him pray in my life. <laughs> Are you home? They don't immediately get out a magic marker and write hypocrite across your forehead, but they begin to realize that what you're saying and what you're doing don't match each other very well. And you tell them all the time that it's really important to obey God, but you act like it isn't important to obey God. Like God is way down your priority list, somewhere slightly above Doritos and behind your favorite TV show. Wow. That may have been closer to home than it meant to be. Yikes. I could, there was, there was, palpable pain in the room there that was <laughs> <laughs> wow if what we're doing all the time says what I say means nothing then I'm giving them uh, I'm, I'm hurting them in two ways I'm causing them to devalue words and I'm teaching them that those things that I've said are unimportant and so it becomes of the utmost importance that we value in front of them the things we say are important. And part of the reason, if I can cut right to the punchline, is that part of the parenting process is setting the stage for spiritual conversion through natural conversion. I'm changing their tendencies. Pretty much everything I've ever taught a child is something they didn't want to do when you started teaching it to them. Whether we're talking about potty training or eating with silverware, it's not on their list. It's not what they want to do. It's not how they plan to live their life. Their natural inclination is in a different direction. And I am suggesting to them that their natural inclination is not the way to go, but that there are higher things to aim for and a different way to do business. And I am setting the stage for them to understand that they need to be converted right to the core of their being and not just in superficial ways on the outside. The process of teaching them that conversion is necessary and in fact desirable is a process which prepares them for spiritual conversion when they're ready. And then a life of being converted by the Spirit of God. Is that making some sense? This is better than you look like it is. So the admonition is, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Now, it's, it's interesting, the, the word provoke and the word anger are actually the same word, and I don't mean the same word appearing twice. I mean it's one word which means to provoke to anger in, in the Greek. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean only to anger, but it, uh, it, it, it means to, uh, to bring them to a point of emotional expression to enrage or exacerbate. The point is, my function isn't to get an emotional response, a visceral response from my children. If they don't ever seem to respond to me that way, that's okay. Sometimes I get a passionate response and sometimes I don't, but regardless of what kind of response I'm getting, the key is that that's not what I'm targeting. Some people are pushing for a reaction. Sit up straight when I walk by. Are you home? That's not what it's about. That's never been what it's about. That's not the important thing. My focus needs not to be to elicit some kind of response from them, but instead to portray for them what needs to be done. And that's why when he, when he goes beyond that, the contrast is, and bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Now, the, the, the discipline there is literally a calling attention to, a putting in mind of. 
It's saying not that I'm going to uh, make uh, your life difficult or bring punishment into your world. It's, it's talking about calling us to what we know, bringing us back. You've been in a situation, every one of you have been in a situation somewhere where everybody knew what was supposed to be happening, but it wasn't happening, and all somebody's got to do is say a word or two, and we understand what that means, and it's time to get busy. It's time to do what we're supposed to do. It's time to straighten out our outfit and behave the way we're supposed to behave. We're supposed to have that kind of capacity with each other. We're supposed to be able to bring that kind of admonition where I, we put each other in mind. We call each other to a remembrance. The things that we say don't teach us, but they remind us of what we already know but weren't paying attention to and call us back. It's saying a good deal of parenting is reminding them of what they already know. And the parents all said, a good deal of it is reminding them of what they already know. If this was about instruction, I can teach you everything you need to know to leave my house in about a week. But I have to keep repeating myself. And I have to keep reminding you. And even when you know better and you've been doing better for a long time, there's occasions where I have to point out to you that that's not the way it's supposed to go. Th this is a part of the process. So there's this, this calling back, this admonition, this discipline aspect, and then there's also the instruction, which is describing a child's education, training, discipline. That, that's what we need to bring to them, right? Our function is not to keep them in line. It's not to elicit a response from them. It's not to have them be afraid of us, but it is to bring admonition, to bring that exhortation, to rise to the standard they've already achieved, and then instruction to keep moving the standard a little bit forward, a little bit higher, a little bit stronger. I'm so pleased that you've started to use the spoon. Now I would like you to use the spoon to put the food in your mouth. I know these are simple examples, but sometimes it's less painful when we deal with the, with the high chair version. <laughs> when you have to have that conversation with a 14-year-old, it doesn't sound as good. <laughs> so it, it becomes Im important uh, for our sake that we're able to look at these things in a context where we can stand to look at them. But, but that's the point. I, we need to keep moving the bar. You've learned the thing I told you to do. You've done it when I've reminded you to do it, but now I need to show you that there's even more. There's another step. There's more to this process. You haven't made it all the way. And that I I is the process that we engage in. That's how we're moving from irresponsible and self-centered towards responsible and compassionate. You do understand, uh, uh, some of you perhaps haven't spent a lot of time around small children before the last few minutes. One of the things about small children, they don't understand what hurts you. They don't hurt you because they're mean and sadistic. They hurt you because they thought it looked interesting to stick something in your ear. <laughs> they have zero compassion for you. They do what interests them and are completely disinterested in what it costs you. It doesn't even cross their mind that they're ruining your blouse or broke your glasses. They feel no guilt or shame about that. It means nothing to them. In fact, it made an interesting noise and they'd like to do it again. <laughs> That's self-centeredness. That's it's all about me. That's a nuisance when you're 14 months. It becomes dangerous when you're 14 years. It's ridiculous when you're 44. <laughs> and unfortunately, there's way too many folks who somehow snuck through the process without picking up these points and got out the other end without ever giving up their irresponsibility and their self-centeredness. And some of us have had to come back to that as adults and re-enter the process of being trained to be responsible and compassionate. But that is, if you will, the, the picture of what we are called to bring. Parents not just bring discipline, but bring discipleship. 
and set the stage for the spiritual transformation which needs to take place. Is that coming through to you? It's interesting, the, the word that we're translating, bring them up in, in this verse, it, if you look at the definitions, they all, whether they talk about to feed or to nourish or to rear up, or uh, there's a variety of other words and phrases which are associated with the definition, they all end up saying to maturity. The concept behind bring up is there is somewhere to go. There's a place to arrive at. We're looking for maturity here. There's a target to be aimed for, something to be achieved. Now, uh, if you'll come on with me to Proverbs chapter 22, we'll, we'll add a little something else to the mix here. The Old Testament instruction here in Proverbs chapter 22 is very simply at verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. The training up here is going to be very similar to the bringing up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord in, in Ephesians 6. Now, of course, we understand it's the discipline and instruction of the Lord, right? It's not just my rules got quiet again. It's not just my rules. My goal is to train you in the way that God would have you to be, to bring you up in the, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. When it says here, train up a child in the way he should go, the, uh, the margin in this particular Bible very interestingly says that uh, in, in the way that he should go could have been rendered according to his way. Bring him up according to his way. Every one of them has their own way. Not their own way of doing everything, but they have their own way, their own gifts, their own calling, their own path. And the point isn't to get them to walk on my path right behind me, like little ducklings, but to bring them to their path to train them toward and present them to their path. And that is pointed out very aggressively by the words that we translate train up in the English because in the Hebrew it means to narrow. And the point is I'm reducing options. I'm not deciding for you what your calling is, but I'm discovering some things it certainly isn't. And they're beginning to fall off the list. It's not my job to pick your calling, but it's my job to make it easier for you to find your calling. And I do that by narrowing the list. It's particularly interesting that this word, which means to narrow, is used more frequently of a dedication or consecration type of event. It's used when you're going to set apart, say, an altar and dedicate it to a purpose. You have just narrowed it. A minute ago, it was a large flat surface that you could use to play cards on or sort clothes on. Or, but now you have dedicated it. It has been narrowed. It has only one purpose anymore. And as the word is used throughout the Old Testament, it's, it's principally translated dedicated. And it's talking about being narrowed to a purpose, being narrowed to the reason. And these, the, the, the children who grow up in your house, the children who come across your life, the children who spend a season with you are not yours, they're God's. And the narrowing is to His purpose and His calling in their lives. I'm going to work to bring about natural conversion so that they are prepared for spiritual conversion. Babies come to us uncivilized. Some of you guys got a hold of natural conversion there like, I don't know. They, they need converting. Believe me, they need converting. The list of things that need to change is very long. And it needs to happen fast because they're getting big in a hurry. On me, when, when, when our children were little, 
they always did what I wanted them to do in the sense that I was bigger than they were. So, you know, I'm going to ask you three times to get in the chair, and then I'm going to pick you up and put you in the chair. We're going to the car. You can walk, or I can carry you. These are the options. Right? It becomes easy. This isn't a contest. I'm never going to lose. There's the easy way and the hard way, but that's the only choice. It's always going to end up the way I said it was going to end up, right? But they start growing. And it dawned on me pretty early in the process that there was going to come a point where I wasn't going to be able to pick them up and put them where I wanted them to go. And there was going to have to be some other reason that they made that move. That this was going to have to be about something other than I'm bigger than you. Because the day will come when they're bigger than me and that's going to be a problem if it's always been about I'm bigger than you. And somehow we're going to have to allow the Spirit of God to lead us through this transition where I'm going to get them to want to do it because I said it instead of to know that I'm going to make them do it. Are you home? And it's an interesting process. You learn a lot about the Lord as you walk through that because you see Him doing the same thing with you. He's got the ability to make me do things, but He wants me to want to do them. And He works and works and works to train me to want to do them. He speaks to me and encourages me and comforts me and leads me to want to do what needs to be done. And hence we get that amazing phrase from Philippians, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. The born in us by the Spirit of God is both the will to do and the doing. I find the strength to do and I find the desire to do in Him. And that suggests to me that when the desire to do grows faint, that I'm not with him the way I need to be with him. And that I'm not walking with the Lord in the way that I need to walk with him. And that, that'll bring us, let's, let's turn to Psalm 127, and uh, we're just about done with this. Psalm 127 is only five verses long. The second half deals with what a wonderful thing children are. The first half talks about the house. In some ways, they seem disconnected, but they're actually intimately related. And they say this, and th this, is a, this is a word for your parents. Psalm 127, beginning of verse 1, says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. For he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Now verses 3, 4, and 5 are very plainly telling us children are a wonderful and delightful thing, not to be viewed as a burden and a nuisance, but as something which we are pleased to participate in, right? But verse 1 and 2 is telling me in no uncertain terms that if I try to do this on my own, I'm wasting my time. That no matter what I build, if God didn't build it, it isn't built. It may be a very impressive looking edifice, but it has no strength and no durability. It has no future if God isn't the builder. If the Lord doesn't build the house, the labor is put forth in vain to build the house. And it has been my experience that regardless of whether we're building careers or households, lives, marriages, families, if the Lord isn't doing the building and we're working with Him on His project, it can look real good, but it can come down real fast. And there have been an awful lot of attractive structures which have come down in a hurry because the foundation hadn't been laid. The point of the story is this. There's a lot of coaching about parenting in the world these days. You can get advice anywhere. And with the advent of the Internet, 
you can get amazing levels of advice. I mean, you just Google naughty children. See what, well, no, that's probably not the one you want. That was a bad choice. Let's, let's uh, Google uh, training children. There you go. That's more like it. Uh, you're you're going to end up with something phenomenal. You can get detailed psychological information. You can get off-the-cuff stuff. You can get some mommy's blog based on nothing other than what I felt like this morning. You can have whatever you like, all of it available. And we can get coaching and counseling from any source you choose to. But the source we ought to be looking to is the Lord who made them. He designed those children. You know, I've had occasion to say this several times in, in recent days, but I'm going to say it again. I had this notion. I, I wouldn't have expressed it this way because I didn't have it formed this clearly in my mind, but I had an attitude when we started to have children together that because we were the same, the house was the same, they were going to be the same. The second one should be just like the first one. <laughs> Why not? Same influences, same situation, same getting the same vocabulary spoken to them in the same tone of voice. Why wouldn't they develop exactly the same way? I discovered <laughs> that God puts temperaments in people and doesn't ask me first. And that people, I had more respect for the notion that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, knitted together in our mother's womb by the Lord after that second child. Not, and neither one was better or worse than the other. They were just so different than each other. Different in the way, what pleased them. Different in what comforted them. Different in how I had to approach them. Different in how they received correction and how I had to bring correction in order to have it received. Everything about them was different. Their entire temperament, emotional makeup, personality as it manifested was completely different. But they're both mine. They should be the same. They come from the same stock, raised in the same way. It should just be bing, bing, bing. Little nesting dolls, right? Not at all. They looked like little nesting dolls. They didn't act like little nesting dolls. There's five different children, five different personalities, five different sets of gifts, five different callings, five different ways of thinking and doing things, five different ways of being blessed and pleased and being irked and annoyed, five different ways of responding to any situation, five different people. Because we serve a God who makes everybody unique. And so I guess circling back to where we started, our purpose is to help them to find what he's fashioned them for and to be ready to be his children in the world. Amen? Well, let's stand up together, if you will. And uh, those of you who are wanting to dedicate children who are not with us because they're in the nursery or they're in the preschool class, now would be your good moment to go and get them. And uh, when you come back, we will call you to the front in a, in a little bit. But those of you who remain, I want to read to you briefly from Romans chapter 10, where it says at verses 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. The promise of this verse is very plain and simple. When we say out of faith that Jesus Christ is Lord, when we believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, his promise to us is salvation. That seems a little odd. It seems like it should cost us more than that, but that's the economy that God operates in. Now, the question that I had when I first came to these things was, how do I know that I believe? What does believing feel like? I'm not sure I've ever believed anything in the sense that you're talking about. And it's a peculiar thing to describe. It's not something that happens in your, in your head exactly. It's not a thought that occurs to you. It seems to happen in the very core of your being. But the scripture tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. As we hear the word, we are given an opportunity to believe. And when we respond to that believing, 
in obedience, God is faithful to his promise. So I'm going to take just a moment and I'm going to celebrate what God has done in my life by confessing my faith. If you would like to join me, you are welcome to. And whether it's a first time or a 500th time, it doesn't matter. We can do this together this morning. I'm going to pray. Dear God, I thank you in Jesus' name for hearing my cry today. I do believe that you've raised Jesus from the dead. And I declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. I thank you, Father, for this new life, for your admonition, for your instruction, for your narrowing in my life. I want to be more responsible and compassionate. Thank you for being a father to me and leading me in the paths of righteousness. For your name's sake, amen.